that. We could use you in my department. Um, so our, our topic for today is, uh, it, it's fascinating, it's challenging, it will remind you of ideas that you've seen either in uh, Matthew 31, Matthew 37, Matthew 30, Matthew 36. Are there any of you here that I've taught before? Except myself. Okay, because I was going to mention also Matthew 32 and Matthew 33, um, but it seems like none of you are in that. Just make sure all the lights are on. Let me just check this one. Oh boy, good. And I always do the following at the start of my classes. I ask that you turn off your small devices and put them away. That's important because if I see somebody texting or, or playing or doing something that, you know, I can just tell has nothing to do with the flow of B41, then that sort of gets in the way of me doing my job, in which case it, it annoys just about all of you if I can't really do my job. So the topic for today is, I, I called it an in, introduction to optimization. And by the, by the end of our class, uh, you will know a lot about how to optimize functions of two variables, three variables, or even n variables where the function is what we call a, a scalar function, a function mapping, you know, Rn into R. Uh, you might wonder at the seventh week of math B41, should we really have an introduction? Well, optimization is a huge area, and it, it comes up in all parts of mathematics and applied math. You know, math B41, we study some optimization. Uh, certainly in one variable calculus we do. Have any of you taken math B61? If you haven't, consider it. If you're majoring in math or specializing in math or in computer science, Math B61 is a pretty popular course. Um, it's not all that difficult. If you love linear algebra, that course is great because there's tons of linear algebra ideas. Now, if you don't love linear algebra, that course is great. Um, it's very interesting and it has to do with optimization but in a very different sense than how we'll treat it here. So the ideas here are, are really coming out of calculus, but it turns out that when we get to what we call the second derivative test, that this is entirely to do with linear algebra. And we all know that this is one of the neat ideas about math B41 is the interplay between calculus ideas, limits, derivatives, even integrals, and linear algebra ideas, you know, vectors and length and all of that. Um, I, I've seen a lot of linear algebra lately because I'm teaching three other courses right now, uh, Math A 23, Math A 33, and Math A 22. And in all of those courses, just now, they're all talking about linear algebra. So I've been seeing a, a fair bit of linear algebra and we see a lot of it in our course. So allow me to just kind of highlight what we know as far as optimization goes for one variable calculus. So this is the sort of one variable situation. So a little recollection of um, optimization from one variable calculus. Optimization from one variable. calculus. Now back in, the, back in the good old days of one variable calculus, uh, most of you, me included, would call this just max min. And uh, the techniques are pretty straightforward and pretty interesting, both from an applied perspective and a theoretical perspective. So the situation here is we've got a, a function named f. It maps the real numbers 
into the real numbers. Uh, maybe the domain of f isn't all real numbers, but for a lot of functions you do deal with in first variable calculus, one variable calculus. You know, those functions are combinations of exponentials, polynomials, trig functions, for many of them, but not all, but for many, the domain is the set of real numbers and the function outputs the real. So you can think about the graph of such a function. Here's a generic graph of such a function. I'm going to, since we're talking about max and mins, I'm going to put a max there, a min there, a cusp there, and the function is going to go something like that. And you might ask, Ray, what told you to pick that graph? Well, that graph shows off max min type things. Uh, as soon as you draw a graph like that, you can't help but notice sort of a local max, local min, local max, local min. Let's give some labels to these points. So I'm going to put that point there. And the x-coordinate, I'm going to call that one x1. And the local minimum there, let's call that x2. Got a local maximum right there. Let's say that occurs at the point x3. And then finally over here, a local minimum there, call that point x4. So for each of the points on the graph of the function, where I've put the dots, I'm focusing on the concept from calculus of local max and local min. Um, well, that's pretty clear. Uh, F has a, we could call it a local extrema or a relative extrema. A local or relative extrema at uh, each such point, uh, x1, x2, x3, x4. So we could call those points x sub i. Here where i goes 1, 2, 3, 4. When students first hear that name extrema, when I explain this in Math A32 or um, when I've taught Math A36, six times or so, or math A37. Sometimes they say extrema, a synonym for that is max min. Okay, so we can say a local or a relative max or min at those points. Um, th this word here, local, or the synonym, relative. This is a little bit touchy to explain. I'm going to explain the ideas there. Just before I do, uh, notice because we can draw the graph, we could imagine the graph of such a function. Um, notice the behavior of the function at each extrema. Now, you can observe that because we can, you know, we can actually draw the graph. And that's one of the beautiful things about functions of this sort. And we actually devote calculus time in junior courses to draw the graph. So having the graph The, the graph shows what f is doing at each extrema. The graph shows the behavior of the function at each extrema. At each extrema. Shows what uh, the behavior of f is at each uh, extrema point. This is an interesting word in mathematics. It's also an interesting word in like child psychology. Um, I say this to my kid, watch your behavior. Okay, watch your attitude, watch your, just one sec. Ma'am, could you put away the device please? Yes, you. I asked everybody and that includes you. Turn it off and put it away please. Thank you. So what is the behavior? Well, it's either this or this or this. So at each extrema point, at each point xi, which we would call critical points, either the derivative is zero, or the derivative is undefined. And it is for that reason why when we're teaching one variable calculus or 
You know, in the fall, if you were going to explain this to somebody coming to UTSC, this is why you would say, look for the critical points. So we have the concept of a critical point. For a function from junior calculus, one variable calculus, the extrema occur at critical points. Uh, everybody knows about that term, and the critical points, they come in two flavors, right? Uh, one satisfies this condition, or this condition. A UND is a good abbreviation for uh, undefined. The word cusp comes to mind. On the other hand, critical points usually, but not always, but usually come from setting the derivative equal to zero and, and solving. So the critical points, we solve this kind of equation, or we solve this kind of equation, and uh, you know, that's the business of first-year calculus. Well, of the derivative equals to zero type, if I had a formula for f, you know, if it's like x squared sine x, I'd take the derivative, set that equal to zero, and I would see that the derivative is zero at x1, x3, and x4. And if I had some creepy function and I differentiate and there's a possibility that the derivative is undefined somewhere, either have a cusp like that, a cusp like that. If the function is a nice kind of function from calculus, then the looking where the derivative is undefined, how could that happen? It could happen because there's the potential to divide by zero. You know, if you divide by zero, we'd, we'd have to step outside and sort of sort that out. And here, the derivative is undefined at x3 because we have that that cusp. Um, you also know from calculus, right, that it's not true that every critical point gives a max or a min. And if you're seeing this for the first time, you might think, oh, critical points always give maxes and mins. One might actually think that. And the picture suggests, well, in this case, that's true. The derivative is zero. We have a a local max, so the derivative here is a local min, the derivative is undefined here, we have a local max, and the derivative is zero here is a local min. On the other hand, if you check out a function that looks like this, for example, and you put a little flat spot, and then you make the function look like a cubic, in fact, if that's the point one one, you can write that down. Now that function, the derivative is zero when x is equal to one. We have a momentary flat spot. In the graph of that function, it looks like y equals x cubed, but it's just shifted to the point one, one. At that critical point, we neither have a max nor a min. And that's usually the prototype example, the standard type of example of where we can have a critical point, you know, where the derivative is zero or undefined, but we don't necessarily have to have a max or a min. But the other way around is true. Where you are going to have a max or a min with one variable calculus, it's either the case that the derivative is zero or undefined for the nice functions that we deal with. So let me just put a little comment in here. No extrema at uh, x equals one, even though the derivative at one does equal zero. So this brings us to the following kind of question. Well, two questions. Number one, um, where we have a max or a min, it, it, it may not be the highest of the high point, and it may not be the lowest of the low point. In fact, for the graph that I've drawn here, and I purposely put an arrow on the left to indicate the function just gets more and more negative, and here I put an arrow to indicate the function just keeps on going, and similarly with this function, the function just keeps growing, keeps going down. The way that this function is drawn, and there's no absolute maximum and there's no absolute min, and yet there are local ones. 
So uh, allow me to just remind about how we can write carefully, like in the language of Math A31, a course that I really enjoy but haven't taught for 14 years. My time will come up. How you would write down, we have a local max and min, um, how we would write that down carefully. So to say that we have a local max, careful definitions of local extrema. So here I'm going to write down in a language that I'm really familiar with, this is the language of mathematicians, the language of uh, mathematical notation. So we would say that we have a, a local max at x1. And the same will also apply for x3. So you could write in your notes uh, max at x1 uh, and for x3. It means the following. Uh, local. So when somebody says to me, uh, Ray, you're a local. That means I'm a person of the town that I live in, which is a little town east of here. You're sort of local to that environment. So when we say that we have a local max at x1, uh, what we're saying is that there's some little interval centered at x1 of some length either side for which when I take any point in that interval, the value of the function at the said point x1 is at least as big as the function value at any points in that interval. So what's key here is the existence of an interval and we use the letter little delta to indicate that. There exists a delta, I'll call it a delta 1 positive so that the value of our function at the point x1 is bigger than or equal to the value of the function at a point x for every x that is close enough to x1. So this little interval, it extends a distance delta 1 to the right and a distance delta 1 to the left and it's a little interval whose center is x1 and so that delta 1 is saying the following if you are close enough to x1 if x is close enough to x1 then the function value at x1 is bigger than or equal to f at x provided that x is close enough to x1 so read that in Canadian please sure local max at x1 it means the following there exists a delta 1 bigger than 0 so that f of x1 is bigger than or equal to f of x for all x in that interval centered at x1 a distance of delta 1 to other side uh, how big is delta 1 answer is we don't know and almost never do we care we just have to know the existence of such. Notice that that delta 1, it, it couldn't be this big. Because if I go way over, the function value over here is bigger than it is at x1. But that means over here, you are no longer local to x1. So the existence of the delta 1 is what gauges the concept of relative or local. Uh, similarly, an idea for x3. Uh, a local min at x2 is described in a similar way. So I'll write that, oh look at this, 84 exams. <laughs> this has got to be every student's worst four letter word, eh? Exams, right up there with test. Uh, local minimum. At the point uh, x2. So again, the, the point of this part of the lecture is for me to remind us how I would write that down carefully, in particular if in the future Parker asks you to do so. He's a really a nice man, but I wouldn't put it past him to ask for these kinds of details. There exists a number delta 2 positive so that hmm, the value of the function at x2 
is less than or equal to the value of the function at a point x for all x that are close enough to x2. The delta is just saying this. You are close enough to x2. Draw a picture of that. Here's a picture of that. Uh, let's see. So if I'm in a little interval around the point x2, then the value of the function is smallest at x2. But that interval can't be too big, because if I'm way far away from x2, the function goes down below x2. So that at x2, we're seldom concerned with how big or small x2 is. But mathematicians and computer scientists, too, to a lesser extent statisticians, but certainly mathematicians, computer scientists, and philosophers are very interested in the following two things. A, does something exist? B, does it exist uniquely? Is there something? And is there just one? Sir, go ahead. Indeed. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. For that function that I drew the graph on, uh, at the point 1, neither of these definitions hold. And that's the point of the lecture so far. Oh, no, there shouldn't be a local maximum here for the following reason. If I draw a little interval like that, centered at the point 1, okay, if I was to magnify that, the horizontal tangent occurs just at a single point. So if I were to, you know, make that much bigger, the tangent line is just like that. And so the, the tangent line is horizontal just at that point. And as soon as I move to the right of that point, the function goes up. And as soon as I move to the left, the function goes down. Now, the value of the function at 1 is 1. But if I took an interval centered at the point 1, as soon as you move to the right of it, the function value is bigger than 1 because it sneaks up a little bit. So if I move just to the right of 1, and that makes the function bigger than 1, then I couldn't have a maximum at 1. Because as soon as you move to the right of 1, you are bigger than the thing you're asserting is a max, which means it couldn't be, by just logical reasoning. In a similar way, I could not possibly have a local minimum at 1. And the reason is that, again, if I take a small interval centered at 1, and I back off to the point, point 0.999, then the function falls below 1. And if at 1 we had a minimum, it would contradict a value very close to 1, which has a value which is less than 1. So your, your questions by students are always awesome. And I usually say, that's a question I wish I had asked. So thanks for that. Indeed, so for that graph on the right, uh, my management students would say the takeaway is that we see that the definition in both cases fails for that point. There is no interval for which the function is always on or above or down or below. Um, one, one last uh, little item. <clears throat> so given a critical point, uh, how about I call that A for a function f mapping r to r. Uh, given a critical point a number a for the function, if you're considering a local max or a local min, but it's too complicated to graph the function because it's got horrible stuff in it, you know, like signs and exponentials and so on. Um, so maybe you, you find that the derivative is zero at a. So how do you tell? And students often ask, sir, I can't bring my tablet into an exam, so I can't see what the graph looks like. The mathematics can peer into the function Given a critical point a for a function f, in, in one variable calculus, we either use the first or second derivative test. 
the first derivative test or the second derivative test to actually check if f has any local extrema i.e. max or min at the point A. So this part of the lecture is just to remind of those two guys. So back in Math A30, you know, we take the derivative, we set it equal to zero, and we get a couple of critical points, and then we either analyze and see if the derivative changes sign as we move through, or we use the second derivative test. Students often ask, sir, I've got two tests. I say study hard. No, I don't mean that, sir. I have two tests, first and second. How do I decide which one? Well, I decide based on knowledge. I certainly have to know the tests, <clears throat> and I decide which one is easier to implement. You may recall from the good old days of first year calculus that this test, it never fails, but this one can. If the second derivative is zero, then the second derivative test is in of itself inconclusive. Uh, where the second derivative test is useful is that it's easy to implement once you've got the second derivative. The first derivative test, it never fails, but it requires you to analyze the, the derivative. That sums up where we are in the good old days of one variable calculus. So when I in teaching and I end a certain part, a little segment in a lecture, be it a one or a two hour lecture, I usually put a little box to indicate that part is, that part is done. Uh, by the way, uh, do you know what this is called? Filled in box, sir. No, it's actually got a name and you can Google it. That little filled in box is called a Halmos. It is. H-A-L-M-O-S. You should Google this. Do it right now. Go ahead. If you Google Halmos, you will find out interesting things. Everybody should know why we capitalize it. Uh, often in math, in other courses, what's the other thing you put at the end? Ah, this, sure. Quite easily done? Hardly. Quick, erase that. Now, what does QED stand for? Quad erat demonstrandum, therefore we're done. Has anybody got to Halmos yet? Did you? No? Yes. Not yet? What did it say? It says he was a mathematician. Yes, he was a Hungarian-American mathematician and? He made fundamental advancements. Fundamental advancements in filling in boxes. <laughs> this box device apparently is credited to the Hungarian-American mathematician who has now passed away. Uh, it's credited to him in ending passages of mathematics. He was a, an outstanding expositor on mathematics and that little filled in box thing. So when you see Parker, he's wicked smart and he's very nice. Take him aside and say, Parker, what's a Halmos? I mean, he, he will turn upside down in, in the joy in explaining. And then you could tell him to sit down and you could explain. This is what a Halmos is. It just indicates the end. Now we're going to go on to uh, some new things to build upon. So in our course, Math B41, we are now ready to answer your question. Go ahead. Yes. No, your students ask the best questions. Younger, stronger, smarter, faster, and more inquisitive. You are. Uh, it is possible that the function could be horizontal, in which case you could have a max or a min at many, many points. That's quite possible. The derivative could be zero at all points on a little interval. Ray, why don't you just draw one? Sure. I could have a function like this. You know, the graph goes up, and then it just sort of becomes flat, like that. And at all points in this interval, at all points in that interval, but not at the end points, but at all points in the interval, the function has both a max and a min. It's just not, because at all points in the interval, 
the function is bigger than or equal to at all points in that interval and smaller than or equal to. So wherever we have a horizontal segment, we have infinitely many max and mins. It's an interesting theoretical idea, but not so relevant in practical applications. So for, for those of you who really, how many of you did take 31 and 37? Not me, well. Yeah, so for, for those of us who really love math, and all the rest of us who really love math, uh, that kind of situation is interesting from a theoretical perspective. In applications, though, it's more single points, one at a time. In math B40, uh, B41, we look at optimization of functions of this form. What we call scalar valued functions of this form. So the name of the function doesn't change. The generic function in mathematics is called f. Uh, here the domain will be uh, Rn. And the function is what we call scalar valued. And here n is some natural number, which we call the, the dimension of our domain space. Now, when n is equal to 1, that's not really the situation that we deal with in math B41. So here, we're mostly interested in when n is at least 2. So functions that map r2 into r, functions that map r3 into r. And I'll show you an example where you can pick your favorite n, like a thousand, and a function that maps um, you know, r1000 into 1, uh, r, r1. So we're interested in optimizing functions of this sort and me showing you the, some of the, the theory behind it and by the time we're done today, you will know how to, how to calculate and interesting calculations at that. So just as some examples of these kinds of functions. That is, the kinds of functions for which we seek to understand the ideas of how to optimize. Uh, well, the first one Uh, I, I looked over some of your notes last night, not while you were sleeping, but I mean the ones posted on our homepage. Uh, there's a standard type of example of a, a function that we see of two variables. And so here f is mapping r2 into r. Uh, actually, we map into the non-negative reals. And, and the graph is interesting. It's one that's not, not too hard to imagine. The graph kind of looks parabolic. And the reason it looks parabolic is that if you suppress either variable, the result kind of looks like y equals x squared or z equals x squared. And uh, in every, if, if I was to look at the function, and in, in every way that you look at it, it just looks like y equals x squared. But the graph lies in three dimensions. So the graph of such a function kind of looks like that. And then we impose some axes. The z-axis comes in like that. There's the y-axis. Pretty nice. And the, the, the surface, the actual surface, is the graph of the function. You can see right down at the bottom, at the point, 0, 0, 0. Because the graph is so readily available, right? You can see down at 0, 0, we actually have an absolute minimum. The function goes down the lowest at 0, 0. And that's pretty clear algebraically because the sum of two squares can never be negative because our variables are always real and not complex. For more fun and games with complex numbers, please take math C34 and then follow it up by math D34. And then you can teach me about complex numbers. Here's another such example. Uh, here's example number two. <laughs> it's this one. F maps R2 into R is given by F of X comma Y is uh, X cubed, 
3 x y plus y cubed. Now there's the function, it's x cubed plus 3 x y plus y cubed. This is the second example of the type of function that by the time we're finished you, you will have the techniques from today's lecture and you'll know how to optimize. Now what's interesting about this function is that uh, notice that uh, an ordered pair goes in and a real number comes out. So this is indeed a function from R2 to R. Um, we would call it a polynomial in two variables because the form of it is polynomial-like. However, um, it isn't too clear to me what the graph of this looks like. Now, given that you are younger, stronger, smarter, and faster, and more imaginative than me, some of you may be able to look at that and say, oh, Ray, here's what the picture looks like. Now, if you can do that, okay, go on by my office, and we may have a job for you uh, in my department. It's not so obvious to me, and I don't think it's so obvious to you, what the graph looks like in a way that the graph of this was pretty obvious. And it's quite interesting that we'll develop ideas in our course that will enable the calculus to look into the function and see where the critical points are without seeing the graph. And this is magnificent. Like the mathematics, it can peer into the function in ways that we can't. This is one reason it's so powerful. It can do things to mathematical things that we can't do simply because we often can't see them. And uh, so those are the kinds of functions. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write down one more. Uh, okay, I'll call this function here uh, g. And g is going to map r3 to r, and here's what g does. g of x, y, z, it is, what the, huh, <laughs> it's this. It's x squared z plus x y squared plus z squared minus 2 times y. I'll read that just to show that somebody can read it. Uh, g of x, y, z, it's x squared z plus x, y squared plus z squared minus 2y. Um, so three variables go in, a real number, so the, the resulting output is a real number, so we indeed have a function of three variables. Uh, Note, we could, we could call x, x1, you could call y, x2, you could call z, x3. Similarly, you can call, you know, x1, x2, x1, x2. Um, now, if any of you can tell me the shape of this, um, <laughs> I wouldn't believe you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any idea of imagining what the graph of this looks like. And the most basic reason is because the graph lies in four dimensions. Never was it so important that 4 is 3 plus 1. 3, the number of inputs, and 4, we've got one more output. And so the picture always lies in the number of output dimensions, which is 1, plus the number of inputs, which is 3. And so the graph of this actually lies in four dimensions. Now, some people who are you know, either like under 30 or over 80 say that they can see four dimensions. And there's some nice things online you can look and see at cubes in four dimensions. But those are very simple things. I, I don't think there's any human way or any other way possible to see what this looks like, see a picture of the graph, because it lies in four dimensions, and yet we will see tools from our course that will have mathematics that can peer into the function and tell us where max and min might happen, the critical point concept, and the tools of our course, the second derivative test will allow us to even classify at those points if we have a max or a min. All of this is true and powerful, despite the fact that we can't see what the graph looks like. Mathematics is very beautiful in that sense. It can do things that we cannot possibly see. And uh, sometimes students say, let me get out of computer science and study math. Nobody says that. Well, I say that. It's a good time just to take a little pause.
because I'm going to introduce a bit of notation. Take a moment, ask any questions so far about any kinds of things. You could exclaim, huh, this sounds interesting, Ray, right? let's see some more. But I have to freshen off the board for a second. Okay, just take 30 seconds. Uh, if you want to take any pictures, but they're being captured, just take 30 seconds and chill, because I need to freshen the board, and then I'm going to get back to business. So if I'm putting my back to you, you can, you can read it. Um, I'm not being rude, I just need to freshen off the board. If we were in IC 130, you know, we would have all eight boards filled up. So the next item I want to talk about is uh, what we mean by local max and mins for functions of this form. What we mean by local max and mins for functions of this form. How we write down mathematical notation for functions that have two or more inputs that capture these ideas, these simplistic ideas from one variable calculus. Okay, I need to freshen the board off, so uh, just take a minute or so and, and uh, just relax while I do that. Not a formal break, it's just a little pause. Okay, the, uh, the concept that I want to introduce, uh, it, it local extrema for a function of n inputs, real value. Here you'll have to recall the notation for an open disk centered at a point. So I'm just going to recall that notation because, you know, we, you might not have seen it, um, you know, past like 8 o'clock this morning or something. So I'll just recall that notation. The open disk idea. So imagine we let the point in Rn be given. So that's an n-dimensional vector. Now something I point out to students when I'm teaching linear algebra and that is you know, usually when you think of Rn, you can't help but think about R2 and R3. Uh, be wild. Uh, think of Google, and uh, in Google, the databases that they work with, you know, you're talking about like R10,000, you know, vectors with 10,000 components in them. And the mathematics needed then, uh, in, in those situations, is, is, is absolutely jaw-dropping. So let a vector in Rn be given, And let, say, r be a positive number. So I recall the following, uh, the open disk. Centered at the point x0 of radius r, quite a mouthful, is the following mathematical notation, big D, can see why we choose D, subscript R, X0. Mathematical notation is great. D for disk, radius R, centered at X0. It is a set of points, right? It's a set of points. How about uh, Y in Rn, for which the distance in Rn from Y to X0 is strictly less than r. And so I take the vector y, I take x0 as a vector, I take the Euclidean distance 
is less than r. Sir, show me a picture. Sure, when n is equal to 2. We've seen that notation before. Okay, here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis, and here's that little fellow, the center, right like that. And, and we know from linear algebra, uh, how many of you took Math A22? You're so glad you're not taking it with me. So I'm teaching it. Is anybody taking it with me this summer? Whew, okay. Um, in A22, to a lesser extent in A23, uh, points and vectors are sort of interchangeable. So I can think of x0 as a point. And then I consider that disk. All the points, a distance r from x0, there's a random point whose distance is less than r. I can see why we use the notation disk. And this is a disk when I think about that in two dimensions. Now, in, in three dimensions, disk is replaced by skin of orange, a ball in three dimensions. What this looks like in four dimensions is anybody's guess. Okay. Uh, what this looks like in n dimensions is not comprehensible by us just yet, but we can conceptualize that, what the disk means. The following definitions are a little bit sophisticated. Okay, so this term local extrema, local max, local min, they both use the terminology of open disk. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, Ray, what's your question? Is open disk in two dimensions, or three dimensions, or a hundred dimensions, is that generalizing open interval? Yes, it is. It's the open interval concept, just in higher, higher dimensions. So imagine we've got a, a function from our course. So I can call that a math B41 function. So it's not too crazy. Like it's not a function you see in math C37, for example. That's a really wild course. Uh, if you want a really interesting course uh, that'll keep you awake for about 100 days, you should take that course. Let that be a math B41 function. So here's what we mean by a local uh, minimum. So we, we say that the function has a local minimum at x0. So f has a local minimum at a point x0 in Rn. So here's the term we're trying to describe, a local minimum at x0, if and only if. I'll say it, then write it. If at the point x0, the function's output is smallest, but that's relative to points which are close enough to the point x0. In other words, if a point x is close enough to x0, then the output is less than or equal to what it is, or bigger than or equal to what it is at x0. So the key idea here is we've got to say close enough, or sufficiently close to x0. If and only if there exists, uh, okay, I'll say a delta bigger than zero, such that the value of the function at x0, local minimum, is less than or equal to the value of the function for all points in this disk. The disk centered at x0 of positive radius delta. So what's the idea? The idea is this. The value of the output, notice real numbers are outputs, 
and therefore the inequality makes sense. We can express an inequality between two real numbers. So what we're saying then is that if, if a vector x is close enough to x0, that just means this. So the idea here is, that's what it means to say that x is in the disk. It means the distance from x to x0 is small. It means that x is close to x0, just like open interval on the real number line. Then that means that the function at x0 is less than or equal to the function value at all points, or all vectors, which are close enough to x0. How big is delta? I don't know. It's just some positive quantity. Local max is similar. So we can say the following. f has a local maximum at, say, a point x1 in Rn, if and only if the value of the function at the vector x1 is at least as big as the value of the function at points which are close enough to x1. So there has to be a radius that is positive, r bigger than zero, such that the value of the function at x1 is at least as big as the function value, but this is true for all vectors x, which are close enough to the point x1. Oh, sir, what is that thing you keep writing like this? Here it is, and uh, there. How do you read that? Such that. I read that as such that. If I was to translate that into Canadian, I would say such that. With the local max, we have no concern as to how big the r is. We just need to know that one exists. Uh, we're not asserting that a function has a local max or a min. And this sometimes is a point that students, as they're getting higher in math, have to come to grips with. Just because there's a definition of something in mathematics, it doesn't mean that one exists. Let me take an example from real life. Uh, I do have a life. Um, I can define a unicorn. Mm -hmm. I can write down the definition of a unicorn. But no such thing exists. Just because we have definitions of things in mathematics, it doesn't mean that one exists in a particular instance. So one asks, well, how can I tell if a function has a local max or a local min? Well, local maxes or local mins occur at what we call critical points. So let me write down that idea. Local max, local mins happen or occur at what we call critical points. And be very careful how I say that. If we have a local max or a local min at a point x0 or x1, then that point has to be a critical point. And for the functions we deal with, it's a certain type of critical point. It's where all of the partial derivatives are equal to zero. So I'll write down the definition of critical point, and then I'll refine this in the case that's of interest to us. So uh, consider a function in our course, f, let that map r to r. So a point, x0 in rn, is a critical point. of the said function, 
if and only if, one of two things happens. Uh, one or two. Please think of the good old days of Math A31. They were good, sir. <laughs> or Math A30, Math A32, or even, you know, high school. Critical point. We reviewed today either where the derivative is zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. So either f is not differentiable at the set point or uh, where the big derivative is equal to zero. This is just like the situation in junior calculus where we have a cusp. And this is like the situation in junior calculus where we set the derivative equal to zero. So this is the big, big derivative, the total, total derivative. Now, it turns out that for the functions of interest in math B41, that this situation occurs very, very rarely. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's that in situations for which the function is differentiable are by far and away the more prevalent situation. Which brings us to the following, which is actually called in our text the first derivative test. So I'll just call this, um, I'll call it something, I'll call it page three. The first derivative consideration for local extrema. And this is where the sort of calculations begin. So imagine we've got a function from our course. Okay, so I write a math B41 function because it sort of expresses the functions that we deal with. Polynomials, rational, trig functions, exponentials, and composition, some products, exponents, combinations, weird things like that. So consider a, a function from our course and uh, assume it is differentiable. Uh, this, by the way, happens mostly, like 99.9% .9 of the time, for functions for which these ideas from our course apply. So I'm not saying that this happens always, but it happens with the same likelihood as this. If you play Lotto Max this weekend, it's extremely likely you won't win the big prize. <laughs> it's very unlikely. The, the odds are about 1 in 28 million, it turns out, some big number like that. So the functions that we deal with with max and min are the types that are differentiable. Um, the, the local extrema test says the following. If x0 in Rn is a critical point. of our function, then. So if we do have a critical point for our function, then, listen carefully, the partial derivative of your function with respect to each of the n variables must be zero at the said point. So I'll write that. This is where the partial derivative parts come in. The derivative of our function with respect to the ith variable evaluated at x zero equals zero for each i equaling one, two, three, up to n. A another way of saying this is that the gradient of f at x zero is zero. The gradient is zero. 
This is key. This part here, ladies and gentlemen, is really important. Notice that mathematical structure in the statement, if then. Gotta love that, if then. In, in the language of Math A67, you know, it's one of those types of forms. Uh, how many of you took Math A67? How many of you took CS A67? It's the same course, I know, but I'm a math person, so I'll do respect. So we study a little bit of propositional logic in that course, do we? Okay. And you study more of it, I think, in CSC B36. And you study a lot of it in the course that I teach with this math. CO9. So if you're looking for a blast, take that course. And notice what this says. It says, if we have a critical point, then all the partials must be zero. So the, the, the takeaway from this is the following. Take your function, take the partials, set them equal to zero, and find out the points where the partials are zero. Amongst those points, is where we're going to find maxes and mins. But we're not saying that at every point where the derivative is zero, we have a max or a min. We're just saying we find them amongst those. So you could, you could sort of draw this really kind of an interesting, abstract, Parker-ish kind of way. Uh, you could imagine a set like that and a set like that. Now this set, the bigger set, is the set where all of the partials are equal to zero. And in here are where we have the uh, uh, critical point. That where all the partials are equal to zero, the, the, the uh, critical point. The critical points for functions we deal with are those points in there where all of the partial derivatives are equal to zero. And in amongst those, in amongst the critical points where the derivatives are equal to zero, we may have some local extrema. So the problem is kind of like a, a one variable calculus problem. We'll take the partial derivatives, we set them to zero, we maybe get some points, and then we wonder, of these points, does one give a maximum? Does one give a minimum? And this is all the more fascinating because usually we can't see what the graph really looks like. So the, the computational technique is uh, what I'll highlight right here on the left, and this is really an important first step. Thus, given a function from our course which is differentiable. We look at the points, or perhaps singular, maybe there's just one point. We look at the points x0 such that the following is true. Those points for which the partial derivatives are equal to 0 We take all of the partial derivatives, we set them equal to zero, and we solve. So we solve n equations. And the points we get by solving those equations will be for us what we call the critical points. So the solutions of putting all of the partials equal to zero is an idea born out of the simple ideas from Math A30 and 31. Take derivative, set it equal to zero, and, and solve. 
There may be points where you have a max or a min where the function is not differentiable, but there is a much, much smaller theory for those, so we sort of teach the theory that comes up in far more applications. Uh, a little warning, however. War ding. So the, the critical points that come out of solving may not give a max or a min. Critical points thus obtained need not yield local extrema. They might, but they don't have to. I just remind us of this little beauty here, right? Remember this from the earlier part of our lecture? And there's the simpler version. So imagine this little guy. We just go back to the good old days of first year. The derivative of this function is 3x squared. 3x squared equals 0 when x is 0. We would call 0 the critical point of this one variable calculus function. But even though 0 is a critical point, we don't have a max or a min. First or second derivative test helps us out. In a similar way, in math B41, when we take the partials and set them equal to 0 and we solve in the solutions we will call critical points, the critical points may yield a max, may yield a max, may yield a min, or neither. And what is amazing is that you can't see the graph to determine this. We have to really trust that the mathematics is going to tell the truth. Okay, I'm going to take a little more of a generous break, uh, a good 100 seconds or so, maybe 200. Uh, I'm going to freshen the board if you want to ask me any questions. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to work out some examples of critical points, and then we'll get into arguably one of the most fascinating parts of our course, and this is called the second derivative test. And um, it, it'll be the best thing that you've seen so far today, at least in our, in our class. But let's take a little pause, freshen off the board and stretch. Uh, text somebody and tell them they should be here. So if, if you are here, you are glad that you are, and if you're not, you wish you were. Here, so everybody take just a little pause. I'm going to get back to work. That was a really nice 200 second break. So I'm going to show you three examples of the critical point idea as always comes up in math B41. Two of the examples I'll work through in good detail. In the third example, I won't work out the details because I don't want to be uh, accused of doing too much. The last example is actually an example that it really comes out of other parts of math, notably statistics, it turns out. This last example, it actually has its roots in a course like, you know, stats B57 or maybe stats B22. Uh, so I won't complete the last example, but you'll get some interesting flavor from it. So here's the first example. Uh, F is going to map R2 into R and uh, f of x comma y is given by it's x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed. So this is the function, one of the examples of functions that I wrote earlier. f of x comma y is x cubed plus 3xy plus y cubed. And the example here is simply to find the critical points. Uh, the critical points will occur because this function is differentiable the critical points occur precisely where the partials are zero. So the critical points of F are obtained by solving the following pair of nonlinear equations. For convenience, 
let's refer to that system of equations nonlinear, as you'll see by star. Uh, so this is common notation for partial derivatives, right? F sub x, xy is the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And I can use subscript notation here for the partial with respect to y. I like subscript notation. It's just more efficient. Here, this requires a whole bunch of symbols. So I can also think of x as the first variable, x1. And I can also think of y as the second variable, x2. So I can think of x as having components x1, x2. And I can think of x1 as being x. I can think of x2 as being y. We could have subscripting x1 and x2. So interesting, solving the system of equations. Well, let's just see what happens here. So when I partialize with x, I get 3x squared. Oh, oh, I get 3y. And then when I go after the partial with respect to y, let's see, we've got 3x. Uh, the derivative there is 0 with y, and then the partial derivative with y is uh, 3y squared. Okay, very quickly, take the first equation, divide through by 3, so I've got x squared plus y is 0, and then in the second equation, I've got x plus y squared is equal to 0. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is really really the system of equations that we wish to solve. So really the action is with that. Now what's interesting about this system of equations is it's nonlinear. And so the techniques of linear algebra do not apply. That's not something like your linear algebra prof wants to make public. <laughs> There's big parts of solving equations that A22 and A23 don't speak to. Uh, we need to solve simultaneously and in general it's a combination of keeping your eyes open, deep knowledge of simple algebra and some luck when we go about solving a system of nonlinear equations. And we're looking for all of the solutions. Well from the first equation we can, make, uh, we can, we can see that y is equal to minus x squared. And uh, then that can be substituted into the second to create the following. Let's see, so I've got x plus uh, minus x squared, and then squared is zero. Okay, so y is minus x squared, and then a little bit of algebra, a little more algebra, And finally, a little bit more. We've got that x is equal to 0, or x is minus 1. So up to now, that's like a purely a, like a, a math A30 type problem. Critical points, x comma y. Okay, so y and x are related certainly by this equation here. So just take them in turn. When x is 0, that means y must be 0 as well. And when x is minus 1, minus 1 squared is 1, and then I negate that, so x would be, y would be minus 1 also. We can summarize then, our critical points are the first one, 0, 0, and the next one, negative 1, negative 1. So what are those points? Well, they're happy points. And they are points where both of the partials are zero. So I know you said you can't draw this graph, but could I draw some graph to show you what this means? Could I, can I show you? I can, and I, I brought something, and some of you will go, aw, even if you're not accustomed to going aw in public. So I brought a, a model of a surface, and when you see it, you'll go, oh my god, is he for real? But, uh, okay, so I brought a model of a surface, and uh, here it is. <laughs> so my, my boy's 11, he's 56 kilos, he's a big guy. 
But he was once small, and this used to fit on his head. His head, not mine. So this is the surface. You can see it. <laughs> oh, that's where that is. Okay, surface. So at, at the point zero zero, the point zero zero is down here, and the surface is at the top. And what I notice here is that the the, the partial derivatives are zero. So one tangent is horizontal like this, and one is horizontal like that. And maybe a piece of the surface is over here, and one tangent line is horizontal, and one is horizontal like that. So I bet you could actually draw it if you tried. So I'm going to try. So I imagine part of the surface maybe goes like that, and part of it goes like that. So you hold it here. This is a spoon. You could put something in there. So what I'm imagining is at this point, the axes are over here. So at this point, okay, the partial derivatives both have zero slope. They're like that. There used to be a song a few years ago where someone did this, but never mind, I don't want to do that. Also here, the partial derivatives have slope zero. So these are meant to be horizontal. and horizontal tangents here as well. So what we know at these two critical points, so really this is the point zero, zero, and there's the point on the graph. And both partials are zero there. And similarly for the point negative one, negative one. So this is all we know at this point. So I can't see the graph, but I can imagine it, and the surface is there, and at these two points, both of the partial derivatives are equal to zero. There's another sort of teaching and learning point here, and that is you should all appreciate that in this example, potential things to be more complicated. For example, maybe there are three derivatives, and maybe these functions have lots of x's and y's and z's, and then the solving of three nonlinear equations in three unknowns can be really ticklish, indeed. Here's another interesting example. Example number two. So there's two critical points for the function in example one. Now here's example two. This is kind of an interesting function. So here we're going to have a function from r3 to r. Okay, and here's the formula for it. g of x, y, z is equal to xy minus yz. Seems pretty simple, eh? Remember, the picture lies in four dimensions. There's three dimensions for the input, one dimension for the output, so I don't have a clue what the graph looks like as well. Let's just keep in mind, right, that we could call that x1 you could call that x2, and you could call that x3. So I have x1, x2, minus x2, x3. And the reason I write that notation is because earlier I wrote the partial derivatives with respect to xi. So let's look at the critical points. Well, again, uh, this is a polynomial in three variables, and it's kind of a well-known fact and I trust that Parker has mentioned it, that polynomials and most of the functions in our course are differentiable. So for the critical points, the critical points of our function, they're obtained by, once again, taking the partials, setting them equal to zero, and rolling up your sleeves and trying to solve. So I take the function g, differentiate it with respect to the ith variable, and solve. So that again is some short form notation 
for the expanded partial with x, partial y, partial z. Uh, what, what is the vector here? And so x is the vector x1, x2, x3, which I mean by x, y, and z, a vector in R3. Okay. Let's take the partial with x, partial with y, partial with z, set them equal to zero, and see what happens. So here's the partial derivative with respect to x. Okay, so it's the partial derivative with respect to x, x, y, z. Oh, this is interesting. I get y. And I'm going to set that equal to zero. And so that's the case when i is 1. Now I take the other derivative, this time with respect to y. So differentiate, oh, it's interesting. I'm going to get x minus z. Set that equal to 0. Now, before I go on, uh, I'm going to do something that math teachers do all the time. And now you do, because you're not beginners. I mean, you've all been here like 500 days at university, and some of you longer. Without warning, math teachers will be calculating something, and they'll immediately bring in an idea from another course. And I just did that. And the idea I brought in from another course is the concept of free variable. Like you saw in Math A23, or in Math A22, or maybe in, maybe in high school, or for some of you, maybe elementary school. I don't know. the free variable idea, and you will see it just now. When I partialize this with z, we get 0, and here I get minus y. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there are my three equations that I need to solve. Uh, clearly y must be 0. And negative y is zero. Oh, so what would it happen? What would happen here if, uh, if somehow this said that y couldn't be zero? That'd be interesting. So what if this one says y is zero, and this somehow said blah 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 y is not zero? Then we would say there are no critical points. So we know with systems of equations, be them linear or not, equations at their heart have this property. Either there's a solution or there isn't. There's no halfway solution. Either there's a solution or there isn't. Um, for the functions we deal with in Math B41, it is rare that there are no critical points, in particular if one asks for them. Usually there are some to be found. The second condition is kind of interesting. It just says that x and z must be equal. Wait a minute, so critical points. Critical points are points that make all the partials equal to zero. Well, the critical points are the points where x and z are equal and y is zero. So we make the following conclusion. There are infinitely many critical points of G, they have the following form. X, zero, X, where X is a real number. So all points of that form. Sir, can you please use linear algebra language? Sure. So the span of that vector, the set of all multiples of the vector 1, 0, 1, the set of all vectors of the form x, 0, x, where x is any real number, is a point that makes all of the derivatives equal to 0. So if I could try to imagine the function, <laughs> I might get sick. But so what we're saying is that the three derivatives are 0 at this sort of infinitude of points in three dimensions. 
whatever that looks like. But at least I can imagine at infinitely many places. That's example number two. And here's the third example, and it's going to be just sketched out very quickly, and it's quite, it's quite, quite a hard example. I just want to allude to a very interesting application. I'm only going to spend about five minutes on this, and there will be lots of details I'll leave out, but it's a very interesting application. Uh, the following is actually rooted in um, parts of statistics and um, also just in, I don't know, I, I want to say databases or something like that. Here's the third example. Okay, so this example is typically called um, line of best fit. This is called the line of best fit example. The line of best fit. So I'd like you to imagine then Okay. Randomly place endpoints in the plane. X i y i. Here's a point. X one y one. Here's another point. X two y two. Here's another point. X three y three. Here's another point. X four y four. You get the point of these points. So I imagine we have the following n points xi, yi in R2. How big is n? Well, here n is 4, but in uh, sampling and surveys, you know, n could be. A thousand. I got a call from Rob Ford the other night. Who? Uh, Rob Ford, he's the Premier of Ontario, as we speak. Actually, tomorrow, actually. And I got a call uh, to go down and watch him be, I don't know, they, they tap him or something. Give him a, a Tim Hortons gift certificate. They do something to announce the new Premier of Ontario. Yeah? You meant Doug Ford, right? No, I meant Rob. He's going to come down. No, Doug Ford. Yes, I did. I, <laughs> I did meant Doug. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, Rob will be there in spirit. Um, for a moment, I thought Doug Ford really called me. <laughs> no, 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 robocall. So probably tens of thousands of these calls went out. So I could imagine, you know, tens of thousands of points generated through all kinds of means. Yes, I did meant Doug Ford, yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Seniors moment. Line of best fit. So what I'm imagining is that you, you could maybe eyeball, we use that term, a certain line. The line of best fit. And, and I use that term eyeball, that's a Canadian colloquialism, it's right up there with A, like how's it going A. Um, so th there has to be some criteria for which there's a certain slope and a certain intercept that seems to be sort of the best line that goes through this set of points, especially if I had lots and lots of points. Well one criteria is to do the following, and, and this is where I'll kind of get to the critical point business quite quickly. Um, measure this distance. Measure this distance. Measure this distance. Measure that distance. A and you can, because for a slope and an intercept, uh, I could write down what that point is. I could write down what that is. I can write what that is, and I can write what that is. And then I could take the distance but taking the distance involves an absolute value, doesn't it? And when it comes to derivatives, when you think of absolute value from 
beginning calculus, absolute value has the unfortunate property of being undifferentiable. And absolute value and derivatives don't go together too well. So instead of minimizing, say, these distances, we could choose to essentially do something that's equivalent and just minimize the size of these squares like that. And I indeed, if, if the line is closer to a point, then you've got a smaller square. And if the line is far from a point, then you've got a bigger square. If the line is fairly close to a point, you've got a small square, etc. So here's the problem then. How do you find the line that makes the sum of the squares as small as possible? This is a very applied problem. So what I'd like you to consider is the following function of two variables. We give a function f that maps r2 to r that allows us to essentially, given the points, calculate the line that minimizes the sum of the areas of all of these squares. In, indeed, if these points happened to be on a line, then you could pick the line in which case all of these squares would have area zero. And if all of the points were on the line except one was off, then you just have one small square area and all the rest of them would be essentially zero. So this is a good criteria for sort of picking the line that is eyeball to sort of pass through the cluster of points in a best possible way. So we give a function f that allows us to calculate uh, M and B, hence the best fit line. Okay, let's just write down the function. Well, here's what the function is. So please consider the ith point. Okay, let's just consider the generic ith point. Let's just say that point is right there. Okay. There's xi. There's yi. And there's the ith point. Okay, and I could find that point there. So the point, the point up here is xi, yi. That point is x i y i. And the x i and the y i is they're all given to us. Positive numbers, negative numbers, etc. But you could find this point, couldn't you? Indeed, that point is x i comma m x i. And here's the interesting math coming up. M x i plus b. So I'm imagining the form of this line is in the standard intercept slope form. And then you could subtract uh, yi, subtract mxi, or you could take mxi plus b, subtract yi, and that gives the distance, and then square it. So consider that quantity. Ready? mxi plus b minus yi squared. Doesn't that give the area of the little square formed by the ith point and the line? It does. Because this is the point at the line, the height at the line, this is the height of the point, and that's the difference, but square, and then add them. Uh, notice that this quantity is now non-negative, and then add those. And call that your function. Whoa. Of two variables. It's a big, big function. 
can you see how to find the critical points? So for the critical points, we find the critical points in the same way, except we have to keep in mind our function variables are the two pieces of data that give our line, the slope and the intercept. So I would have to take the partial, oh my god, the partial derivative with respect to m, m, b, set that equal to zero, and then the partial derivative with respect to b, m, b, set that equal to zero. Well, you could do that. Let's just walk through. How would you partialize with m? Wow. You get the sum, the 2 goes down, the 1, but then you would deploy the chain rule. And when you differentiate that inside part with respect to that, xi becomes the constant, doesn't it? In a similar way, when you partialize with respect to b, the 2 comes down, we put a 1, so we're going to have another summation, but then when you differentiate that inside part with respect to b, you just get 1, so it doesn't multiply anything. Now, the solving of this takes a little bit of algebra, which, which I'm not going to do, but you, you can solve, and the things that you solve with, the, the, the equations you get, end up having sums of the xi's, sums of the xi squareds sums of the yi's and sums of the xi's and yi's. If you take a course like stats B22 or stats B23 or for you men and women might be more like stats B52 or B57, there's this part in that course where you sort of look at the line of best fit and the solving for the slope and the intercept actually come out of math B41 techniques. Okay, oh, for those of you who ask that we can stay here till 12, I'm just kidding. Nobody sent me an email and said, can we stay till 12? No. Um, yeah, that third example I just want to leave like that. So just to sum up, there's this concept of critical points. Now, the next idea is that, well, for each critical point, how do we tell if we have a max, if we have a min, we don't have any? Could you imagine a function that has a maximum? can imagine a function that has a minimum. Can you imagine a function that has no max or a min? I can, and I brought one. So I'm going to show you one more physical model. Just a picture to kind of leave off the picture in your mind. So you can pick these up at Walmart, or I shop. Ooh. Uh, so you'll recognize, maybe you have some of these at home. So what I'd like you to imagine is that this is the surface of some function of two variables. And what I'd like you to look at is right where my finger is, like that, right there. And what's interesting about that part is when you look from this direction, like that, it looks like you've got a minimum. But from this direction, you've got a maximum. So at this point right here, one partial derivative is zero, the other partial derivative is zero, so right at that point where my finger is, the surface is indeed flat, but we don't have a max or a min there. And that point is called a saddle point. And the second derivative test, which Parker will really enjoy teaching next week, the second derivative test is used to determine if we have a saddle point, or if we have a minimum point, or if we have a maximum point. That second derivative test, it entails looking at some matrices, some determinants and the signs of them. That'll be a very nice lecture. I wish I was doing it, but Parker will love to do it. He'll be back next week. Ding, it's 11 o'clock, good time to stop. So thanks very much, I hope this was interesting. Parker will be back next week. We'll cross paths when we do. That's very nice. Um, yeah, my office is uh, IC 466. You've probably seen it if you're on the fourth floor. It's the one with all the newspaper stuff on the door. And uh, if any of you are interested, I'm teaching Math C09 this fall. Uh, it's a blast. Almost as interesting as this. Have a better day. Parker will be back next week.